Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Lucid, and I'm once again joined by the excellent Dominions player, Sai. This is the formerly excellent Dominions player, Sai, joining Lucid on yet another episode. Yeah, we had a pretty cool episode last time. We had major battles between TNG and Zabalba, where Zabalba came out ahead, and then we had major battles against Zabalba and Vettiheim, where Zabalba came out very much behind. But they were really fun to watch for the viewers. So as always, we win. Yeah. And so we got another kind of interesting turn here. Let's see what, what we have from TNG. Bit of bad luck this round. One of our full pin Wind of Death casters got assassinated. And it killed him through his bodyguards because he cast Horde of Skeletons once, then charged the Earth Elemental. Oh, God. Yeah, sometimes if you put gear on them... The thing, you know, you've talked about this before, but they think they're a thug. Yeah, so. it has to do with how much gear is on them. And I think that part of it is also that they have to have a weapon. But the yeah. the Smith guys already have, like, a base weapon. So that's probably enough to count. Yeah, well, it was a full pin wind of death. So he had a rune smasher and things, I'm sure. Mm, yeah, um, that'll do it. All right, pretty small chance of being picked for the assassina assassination to start with. Could have definitely used more attrition on that pan army. The real bad hit was our demonic, uh, demonic cleanser caster routing immediately before he could pass out. Yeah, you'd notice that, that too. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize they had scripted him, that, so they had intentionally not given him uh, morale items because they were planning on him like casting another spell and being basically passed out for the rest of combat. That's so. very hard to do, though. Yeah, I mean, if they're only going to be awake well, for like. It, it's rounds. hard to do it reliably before they start routing, though. And then yeah. I think the... Yeah, so this, the spell would drop pretty quickly. Yeah, and like, with Blood to... Rain, it's... Like, Blood Rain, when you're starting the battle with, like, nine morale, yeah, the and, and then Blood that, Rain like, and Wailing Winds, it's fast. You need to give them some sort of fatigue gear, just because when you're passed out, you recover, like, uh, I think it's five extra fatigue per round. So that plus the natural one means it's very hard to keep someone passed out unless you, like, build them specifically to do that. Yeah, I, I think that would be okay for, like, a fringe spell. You know, like, something that was like, oh, yeah, this would be nice to have up all battle. Like, maybe relief or something. I mean, maybe not relief, but I don't know. You could imagine one. Like, maybe you're like, yeah, I should probably put Firestorm up. You know, but you're not, like, counting on it. But for demonic cleansing, like, you really need that. Like, yeah. so, Okay. The odds of that happening were low. Oh, were not low, but they weren't too high either. With it, we would have swept that fight. With demonic cleansing cubes killing Ozzy's on contact through armies of gold, every hit they take is 24 magic acid damage to every adjacent Ozzy. Yeah, we've seen that. Works? We'd seen that kind of happening at the start of the fight. The beginning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just didn't it didn't last. I didn't know that was how it worked. I, I didn't know that every time they got hit, it hits everybody around them. I thought it was every time you got hit, it hit the person who hit you. I'm pretty sure it's just the person who hits them. Because a, a damage shield is part of the a combat resolution thing for that unit's damage, I thought. Did, is, do we have some place I can see cubes here? Curious minds want to know. Yeah, you might need to go back to the last turn to watch it. But I'm, I'm yeah. fairly confident that it's not um, doing damage to the whole AoE. Okay, well, we'll put that on our list of things we need to figure out. Okay, because once everything is asleep, we need our vampires to slowly kill everything else, which they can do if the Aussies are dead, but they're not going to chop through 100 sleeping Aussies with Will of the Fates and 50 Dark Vines before they run out of time, especially when there are any elementals walking around. That was my thinking. I think the odds were still in our favor, but oh well. I'm not trying to live so high risk is pretty much the only fights I'm doing. Sadly, I am I seem to be very consistently having a hole in each of my plays that we both miss and get us killed with a little impact. Yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of sucks when that happens, but it makes total sense. Yeah, and, you know, when you're fighting, you know, on the back foot, it's easy to make mistakes. So. Yeah, exactly. From Demonstenes, killed... Ventral Waters killed one Hydromancer, two Adepts, 17 Sages... Two survived. Fishmaster Sog, one of the mercs, a servant of the oracles, 11 scouts, and a seduced celestial or ceremonial master. Uh, I appreciate that lich. he's giving us these updates. Yeah. It's so obviously, we I, can't you know, see that. Right. And also, I think there is a little bit of this, like, he just wants 
some of this he doesn't i don't think he loves pan <laughs> yeah i'm sure some of it's schadenfreude yeah he there's some there's some pleasure out of this okay I'm disappointed we messed up the demonic cleansing part of the script. Part of the consequence of losing all our hydromancers fighting Arethia is water for excess and our only surrounded fort got really tricky. So we had to fly in a celestial master. But the guy Latch moved out to do this didn't have morale gear and he was outside a lab. And it's too far to fly from the capital. I didn't catch it because I think we were we have different scripting habits. I generally put, put the gear on first before moving mages out on an important job, so I'm not used to double-checking the kits part of the script. We should have brought the pretender to do demonic cleansing, maybe with the script to returning himself after seven turns. That might have been a risk worth taking with our vengeful water caster, who doesn't have a death pan, and thus isn't twice borned. Oh, it doesn't have a death path, and thus isn't twice borned. Yeah, that's kind uh, of... This yeah, is definitely like a hindsight thing, though, I think. Like, you really can't, I don't think that you can really say, like, oh, yeah, you know, obviously we should have prepared for everything. Yeah, we should have brought our perfect morale pretender. I think you could, in hindsight, say, like, okay, we should have put a morale hat on our... Yeah, uh -huh. and I think that's fair. But, I mean, you called yeah. that out as well. Um, right. I just don't think that it's fair to say, like, that, um, uh, you know, you should bring a totally different caster for it. Right. Still, I think the first turn of the battle shows our pre-game national strategy for fighting Aussies and Seir. De uh, demonic cleansing powered cubes instantly annihilate demons with linked zero weapons. Hopefully viewers can enjoy them as a tool for any nation to build late game armies. Smiley face. Yeah, yeah. everyone likes cubes. <laughs> yep. They were Arco's big thing for a while too. Yeah. A message from Gath. Hello again. I expected Tian Chi to hold the throne of water, which he didn't because of the assassination and other reasons, but definitely didn't expect that from this, this tilting me a little bit. <laughs> Just reading it. I expected like <laughs> you're like four of you wanting somebody and you're like, I expected him to hold this throne. Like what's what's going on? <laughs> Misjudging diplomacy as I'm like dogpiling somebody. I wouldn't say this diplomacy so much as effectiveness, right? Like he's not yeah. saying that Tian Chi is doing like that he's being a, an unreliable person. It's just that he's falling quicker than expected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's fair. Definitely didn't expect that from Betty Heim after seeing him lose his god with no scripting last turn. Clearly, it was another proof that Zawalba can be beaten no matter how many Aussies he has. Anyway, there's 300 Aussies and 38 Dark Vines less in the world now, which is probably about one to two turns of his income or less considering all the discounts. Garion was the last demon lord, and he will have to enjoy his infernal home for now. Not only is he only not only is he one of the worst, but this will allow me to continue relying on protection from Garion, Shadow Imps accompanying my main stack to banish flames from the skycasters or murdering winter casters to the abyss. It's very unlikely that Zabalba will attempt demon lords now, and if he does get Garion, I should see it. Ill Winter not going down is probably good for me since the slots won't be open for a while. And cold doesn't hurt me as much as Pan, for example, because he has more income overall. P.S. Next turn, I'm planning to reveal and explain our true late game strat. So stay tuned if you haven't already figured it out. Okay. Have we seen anything that's gas late game strat yet? I have seen it, but I don't think I should comment on it until we actually see it. I don't think okay. we've seen it together as a casting pair. Gotcha, so, gotcha. I think I've told you about it. Yeah, no, because we've <laughs> talked about it. I was, I was asking if we'd seen it in game. Yeah. Uh, so I take it um, the answer is no. I think the answer is no. Okay, okay a message from Zababa. Famous last words from last turn about Betty being mostly checked out. Yeah, that's always hilarious. We had some scripting mishaps on our on our side, but Betty concentrated force as well and carried the day. The big battle with Tianqi on the Water Throne went quite well, especially with the Infernal Disease Spam this turn, hitting the key Demonic Cleansing Caster. Backup Caster... Oh, interesting. Okay, so this is a detail we missed. So he had two Demonic Cleansing cast. I think I rem somebody DM'd me this. I think Demonic oh, okay, yeah, might have sent it to me. That actually wasn't in um, the list that we got, or the complaints, I should say, that we'd gotten from TNG's hindsight. So it's interesting that Shivalva was told about it. Yeah. Well, they would have seen it too, you know? But I mean, oh, I'm sure right, they right, could right. tell, yeah. right? Well, they would have um, seen, you know, we killed this suspicious... A water four guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So apparently the guy that that ran was a backup. And the it, it, it makes total sense to not put the morale gear on a backup, right? Because they're just there. They're casting it second in the script. They're only going to cast it if the first guy gets killed. And you plan to put him asleep afterwards, right? And so the first caster got killed by an assassination. And then the second caster runs immediately after casting it. That That feels a little bad. Yeah. It's unfortunate, as they say. But, you know, the Infernal Disease spam isn't free. You know, Zabalba's buying the boosters, getting the mages to cast it. And, you know, it's you're fishing, and sometimes you catch something. Yeah, sometimes you catch them, sometimes they catch you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Although, uh, yeah, with, the demo- with Infernal Disease, it's almost risk-free. It's basically just, like, how many big blood mages you have. And in Shivalda's case, at this stage in the game, they have a lot. Right. One might even say they um, have enough. <laughs> You know, but I don't think, like, if somebody's doing scout spam or something, it's not worth it, you know? So, um... Yeah, but TNG's been reduced in provinces that spamming commanders is probably not at part of their arsenal anymore. Yeah, that's fair. And, yeah, I, you know, diseased demons, if you have armor, are usually not very hard to hold off. But, and TNG's been kidding his guys pretty religiously. But you can also just gym bait them too. That's another thing. If they don't have enough gyms on, it can be like an extra gym bait and then they won't get their spell off. So yeah, you know, it can be really good. Um, but it can also kind of suck too. Um, all right. While this is relatively easy and cheap to gear our commanders to be able to resist demons, uh, at this stage of the game, our sparing use of, Inver- of Infernal Disease probably meant that TNG wasn't thinking about gearing all of his commander's mages to resist disease demon assassinations on the turn he was breaking siege. For big blood nations, Infernal Disease, along with Sinless or Horror, are great at forcing your enemies to invest disproportionately more gems and gear into countering them than you did blood slaves into casting those spells in the first place. Toldy. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally. that's a great synopsis. Yeah. The, the value of the spell... This is something Maryland likes to talk about, right? Like the fleet and being idea, right? The value of the spell isn't that you're going to spam it all the time for the rest of the game. The value of the spell is that you could cast it and and the things they have to invest to counter it are very high. So if you don't do it, then you do. And if they do do it, then you don't. So. Yeah, you, you basically have to, you have to pay for it. And then they get to choose whether or not they check and make sure from time to time. Yeah. Well, what I will say is if you do like a really good budget kit for late game is you do like armor of knights, uh, a fire hat and a demon bane. And between those, you're going to be basically immune to most of the late game fuckery. You know, mm-hmm. um, you'll be basically immune to the demons uh, like infernal disease. You'll be pretty resistant to you might die to like earth attacks and stuff, but you'll be resistant to flames from the sky. You'll probably have enough hit points to live through murdering winter. You know, yeah. Okay, let's jump to the map. Let's take a look at T and Chi. We've got Ghost Riders coming out from Pan. Okay, T and Chi riding out again. This is actually a pretty significant commitment from T and Chi. Yeah. Just because he he no longer like these wyverns are going to be like, quite a bit harder to replace. Yeah. Pan's doing army of gold now. Pillar of fire spam. And these little thralls are not very good, but with army of gold on them, they provide there are plenty of enough buffer for these mages to just destroy things. Yeah, at this point, I would say that they're plenty good, actually. Like they're not they're not amazing individually, but like as is, they're totally fine. Yeah, and if these wyverns had gotten on the mages, they probably would have won this fight. They'd be close. A big reason is the mages wouldn't be casting things; they'd be trying to punch them in melee. But Pan just bringing just enough stuff. I mean, Pan is showing how much mileage you can get out of very budget centaur sage squads. Yeah, I would also say that like these aren't even that budget. Like, you know, they're we talked about this before. They're like over a thousand gold. I think it's more just that they're extremely hard to deal with, right? Like as a raiding yeah. party, they're I would say even like overpriced for what you would want to bring for raiding. But like that's not all that they can do, you know? 
Well, yeah, I mean, here we see with a bit of chat. I mean, TNG, I don't know how much he paid per Wyvern, but it was a fair amount, you know? There's 60 of them. I mean, that must be... They're at least a gem per Wyvern, right? So it's probably at least 60 gems, and then these Celestial Soldiers are like three gems apiece, or two. Yeah. And that's just so the sheer are... efficiency of these sages. Like, we'd kind of right. been, been saying that all game, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... And then also just bringing some chaff. You know, I think he did burn out the communion at the end, it looks like. But, yeah. This I mean, is really well, well played from Pangea. Yeah. And the thing is that, like, he can just keep using these guys, right? Like, this isn't even, like, a one-and-done thing. Like, this is just going to keep happening. Right. Yeah. And it's going to be real, real strong. Okay. We've seen these raids. He's continuing to raid here. Nine centaur sages. Raids here with the pan. Let's see how the pans are kitted. This looks suspiciously like your games. The pans in the back buffing each other. I think you probably did a little more artfully, but well, I used one pan, one dryad for the most part. Yeah, but yeah, pans are super efficient at that, just because they're kind of like big boys. So the things that can kill them tend to require a very significant commitment. Yeah. Agartha moving on this TNG throne. Agartha slowly crawling their way back into... Well, we, we still, can't, still can't even say relevancy, but crawling their way back into the as close as they can get to it. So I heard a rumor, and the rumor that I heard was that Agartha is actually a Pangea vassal. I can and, believe that. And that the throne that he's holding, so this throne is going to be like held for Pangea. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means Pangea can just come take it whenever he wants. I mean, because theoretically anybody could take it from Agartha whenever they want. But th that's what I heard. So yeah, I, I, can... I, I don't I don't love that. But, you know, at the same time, what's Agartha going to do? Yeah, I don't love that either. But like, I, I can believe that just because I would say that out of everyone, Pangea has probably been the most responsive to diplomacy. Right. Yeah. So it makes sense in, in that vein that, like, you know, if one person's going to be the person who you go to, then it would be Pan. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. Let's take one more look at this army. It's got the Agarthan God. It's got about 60 Umbrals, maybe a little more. A pile of corpse, iron corpses, which have pretty good protection. Yeah, iron corpses aren't, like, amazing units, but they're very efficient units. Mm. So it makes a little sense. Sappers at the back for siege strength. That's cool. I'd love to see if Ulm has similar units. I'd love to see a strategy around sappers because this pickaxe is like very damaging. Yeah, the problem is the nine attack though. Like they can't deal that, and it's also non magical, so they can't deal that damage in practice to most things that you want to fight. I know, but you know, I'm just imagine there is a scenario where somebody's like has a protect, like a protection tanking thug or something, and you're like, oh, I know, I'm going to use my pickaxe, dudes. I've never seen that happen. I just feel like it could, and it would be really cool. But... Yeah, it would be fun to, to, to like actually come up, but yeah, right. I wouldn't expect it by any means. Yeah, yeah. And what is this? Oh, okay. Ill winter things. Yep, ill winter can indeed cause problems if you're not preparing for it. Gath is moving out this way. Oh no, he just patrols out a Zabaldan scout. Is he blood hunting? Maybe. Probably. Yeah, he is. Yeah, which makes sense. Although the fact that he's doing it on his border is a little bit risky, I guess. But I mean, I guess, you know, you want to blood hunt wherever you can. So if you've got like mages out there that you had brought with your army, you may as well like blood hunt whatever is conveniently closest to them. I mean, he's getting an enormous border with Zabalba too. Like it's hard for him to, I mean, he's got like an eight province border here. And then he's got, uh, it's a little smaller down here, but five yeah, the, provinces. The trick as far as diplomacy goes is I don't see a way in which those two don't fight, which is very scary, right? Like you don't ever want to be pinholed into like what your next war target is like that. Yeah, I mean, there's some ways that the game state could go. Like it could go Zabalba. I mean, it could go Gath and Pan fight while Arithia and Zabalba and Zabalba fight. 
Like that is a theoretical thing that could happen. I don't see that as really likely because that seems like very risky for both sides. I feel like everybody's yeah, going to want to make say. less risky plays, you know? And I also feel that benefits maybe Zabalba the most. Like Zabalba would probably love to 1v1 Arithia while the while Gath and Pangea wear each other down. Yeah, the one thing that I'm thinking of is that just based on the like Nexus versus um, Astral Corruption side of things, I could would kind of see Gath and Shivalva becoming allies, but I would basically only expect that in response to the Astral Powers putting something up. Right, yeah, that's another way it could go. It could go Pan trying to control Nexus versus Gath and Zabalba controlling Astral Corruption. And then that could be like a 2v2. That would be really fun. But I'm pretty sure we know who would win. I think Gath would win that. I mean, Gath and Zabalba would win. Yeah. But that uh, would be an well, interesting thing. I mean, Pan maybe. is really okay. strong. That was about to say, like, Pan is actually really strong. And those sages aren't exactly uh, spending gems when they go out in those little communion balls. So I actually don't think that it's, like, as, as one-sided as you seem to have implied there. <laughs> I, I, definitely... I don't. I just don't think Pan has that many armies left right now. Like he doesn't. I like Pan doesn't have the quantity of armies now. I think it's going to be really hard for somebody to take a Pan fort, you know. But like if you're bouncing around and hitting it, like I could see you spreading, especially if Pan's getting hit on two major fronts at once. I could see Pan getting spread thin where they start losing infrastructure eventually, because like when he's doing these fights, he he needs like a hundred mages for the to fight an army. I think. I think maybe there's wrong, like a maybe but... eventually there, but like I don't think that yeah. it's at, at all like uh, foretold that they would lose. I think that the other thing is that like just being able to efficiently use like these big astral mages is like a strength in end of itself, right? Like what yeah. is what we've already seen that how devastating gifts from heaven spam can be against Vettiheim, right? Like no matter how heavily you buff up your guys, it, you can't make anything that's invincible against that. And Pangea, right. meanwhile, can use Vortex of Returning stuff so that your armies are never actually safe in the field. That's true. And we haven't seen Master and Slave plays yet, but the, when, once you start having 64 Communion Slaves to play with, you can start doing some really powerful Master and Slave shenanigans too. So Yeah, and when they fixed that bug with the uh, Communion scaling, it really empowered Master and Slave in particular. Yeah. What is, what is it? It's two to the what to get Master and Slave? I mean, to get 64? It's two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty, sixty-four, uh, six. So six. Yeah, the, the e easy shorthand for that is sixty-four. Right, but, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So, damn. Yeah, that would be. Is it a six-pin bonus or is it half of that? I can't remember. It's half uh, of six. that. No, it's it, yeah, it's a three penetration bonus. But it, that's a huge swing in basically that is a any huge instance. Swing. Yeah. So. Yeah, now that's assuming you get the three pin. That's assuming you were starting off as an Astral 8 caster or whatever, right? So, you know, if you start off lower, you're not going to get that full pin. But, well, damn. Okay. Any battles here in TNG we missed? TNG and Arithia. This, is, this looks interesting. What, what could this be? Wind of Death is my guess. Got a Storm... Yep, this uh, is the yeah. Wind of Death caster. Yeah, he's got the penetration gear. I was about to say, like, maybe Wailing Winds, but no. Yeah. No. Yoink. Not super worth, but, you know, not horrible. And doing returning, there's a chance you get lost in the void, too. So, this, you know, it's not a it's not a risk-free play from TNG. What was this? Was this trying to storm? I think this is just scouting, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, he could have gone for the storm, but... Yeah. It probably would have worked. Uh, nothing in here would have killed that guy. And if it, especially if it was feeble minded, I mean, just send him in there to die. I guess you kind of didn't want to give it to TNG as a chassis, though. But uh, Okay, I, let's scroll through here, see if I missed anything. There aren't really a lot of battles this turn, so I think it's going to be a quick episode. Yeah, after what we were given last time. Yeah. Do we watch this? Oh, we did. Yeah. This was a pretty cool uh, battle. So. Okay. I think that's it. What do you, what are your thoughts here? I mean, we're kind of seeing the effects of the, uh, 
what was it ventral waters and slowing down pangea yeah. but now they're actually like pushing forward like they basically had to pull back they had to re regroup they took very heavy sage losses for several turns but now they're kind of getting their stuff together so now we're going to be seeing most likely tng fall within i want to say like the next 10 ish turns which is i guess still pretty good as far as like holding out in these late game situations especially when you've already lost so much gear but TNT went from like you know being scrappy and fighting back, I think, to like a dying position. Now that we've seen right. like the people who are fighting them reformulate in order to actually like push and succeed. Yeah, I feel like TNT was like really, you know, they were playing a bit like a, I don't know, like pick your general in history that will like fight uh, desperately to like look for like different offensive plays they can make to like turn things around. I think that started that spirit started to leave their body, right? And they're now looking at like, okay, you're not going to get our stuff for free, but I don't think they're looking for the same kind of aggressive rideouts. I mean, they kind of were here, but like this was just so desperate. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not a matter of like that they're not looking for it anymore; it's that they can't find it. Yeah, that's probably also true. But I do think those go things go together. Once you like can't find it for a, a lot of times, like you're probably going to lose motivation to like really look for it, especially if you're having to like test and stuff to see if it's going to work. But yeah, that's true. Okay, well I think that's it. We'll flash through score graphs real quick since this was a quick one. Pangea pulling into position one again for provinces, pretty much tied with Gath. On forts, Pangea is almost almost double Gath, seventy percent more. Then it's Gath, and then it's Arithia, and Zababa, and then TNG. And then Income, Pangea with a good solid 30% lead, or 25%. But this is mostly just from blood hunting. So that's kind of, you know, make of that what you will. Mm -hmm. It's but mostly, yeah, the patrol stuff. This really is two tiers, right? Because Pan and Zababa, I mean, Pan and Gath are double Zababa. It's, it's pretty crazy. Jim Income, Pangea number one, uh, Gath number two. He yeah, has a Bald and Arithia tied. This really is a story of, of just, this really is a duopoly here. Yeah. It, it's really the Pan and Gath story at this point and how other people are going to be playing around and with them. Yeah. I, I do feel like if you, I, th I feel like, and I don't think it's a great, I don't know. I don't think it's great for the Dominion scene exactly. But having somebody in the game that you trust that's a good player and y'all just kind of having each other's backs while you fight other people, I think is a really strong strategy. And we're kind of seeing that borne out here. Um, they've done it to a degree I think is like kind of not cool where they're like have a defensive alliance too where they'll fight whoever attacks the other person. Which that, that I think is kind of not cool, but... It's a strong strategy. And I don't think that can be yeah. denied. I can't knock them for it, honestly. Like it, yeah, it's, you're trying it, to win. Yeah, you're going to take the most effective option. Yeah, and it's on the other players to like realize because that's a strong strategy. You have to have your eyes open to look for it and play you around know? it. Yeah, exactly. And play around it. Like when you realize people are in an axis, you have to like be like, "All right, guys, let's organize." The other thing though is that the I don't know necessarily if the axis is stable. Just on the base, not on the basis of like, you know, it being good for either of them to break it off, but just uh, that whoever gets out ahead of recruiting allies to their side is going to have such a big major advantage. Yeah, I think it's stable because I think the thing is like for a while, I think it's stable up until a point, right? Like at some point they are going to have to turn on each other. Right. But my point um, was more just that whoever like moves first in order to recruit other people to their cause is going to have a pretty significant advantage, I would say, once things actually break down. Yeah, I think so too. But so that's kind of like the game, right? But I think they've ridden it. I mean, it's been so profitable for them for so long. And I don't think they should have started before now, but may, I mean, maybe subtly, right? But I, I don't think they're very interested even now on turning on each other immediately. I think right now they're just entering like the courtship phase where they're trying to like court the other powers. So yeah, that would be my guess as well. Okay. Well, this was a pretty quick one, which is nice. It means we did get to go maybe record another one. So yeah, I've got uh, some. All right. Well, viewers, thank you for watching. And uh, Sai, as always, it's a pleasure having you. Absolutely. Thanks for hosting. All right. Take care.